Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, this is O-Culture, where we transmit conversations on esoteric art, science, and history at 528 hertz. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Your time is appreciated, and so are your subscriptions. I am grateful to those of you who keep hitting that subscribe button. And you're coming from everywhere, man. New listeners in Russia, Japan, China. This show is either getting some traction, or I'm just being monitored by overseas operatives. Either way, thanks for checking in. My guest this time around is Jane Kyle, proprietor of the website TexasUFOSightings.com, where she tracks UFO-related stories from around the Lone Star State and the rest of the world as well. Jane and I are going to be chatting about strange Egyptian hieroglyphs on wreckage found at Roswell and Rendlesham and their connection to quantum physics. We'll also be talking about the Black Knight satellite, a curious Pepsi-funded short film about it, and the satellite's connection to Philip K. Dick. And of course, UFO sightings across Jane's home state of Texas, including dark triangular crafts, mystery stars, ball and earthquake lightning, upside-down tornado portals that spew gold, silver, metallic paper with symbols printed on them, and UFOs and chemtrails. Jane and I do chat for a few minutes up front about some other various things, but all in all, it's a wild time, and I hope you enjoy it. Jane Kyle, how are you? I'm doing great. How about you? Also doing great. Thanks for asking. I appreciate you taking the time this morning to talk. I'm so glad to have gotten asked to talk. I love talking about this stuff. I could just talk about it forever. And sometimes you bore friends and family members. So <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> hey. so there are podcasts like these. <laughs> I absolutely understand the friends and family thing, you know, I mean, it, it's not rare to find somebody who's as much into the fringe as you are, but it, it sure is nice to talk to a kindred spirit sometimes. Yes, indeed. I don't know if you've heard the show yeah. before. Uh, it's fairly new. One, I had planned to listen before, you know, we did the show, but I haven't gotten the chance. That's okay. And that's I... just, well, that's mainly just being a mother and then having the job job <laughs> to make money and then having of course Texas UFOs is a huge part of everything so I don't get to listen to anything I don't I haven't even been listening to Coast to Coast AM lately which I usually listen to you know every single night it's on so you should wow, not you, take it personally you, do you <laughs> so I've just been busy well between you and me and whoever's tapping our call right now. <laughs> I, um, I'm not a fan of Coast to Coast anymore. I don't like George. Mm -hmm. You're not of... the only one. Yeah, this is not like an uncommon sentiment by any mm -hmm. means. But yep. George just doesn't really seem like... He seems more of a shill than, than he was, you know, maybe 10 years ago. And it, it mm -hmm. just it really disappointed me. Because I had... I had fallen off the coast to coast train for a long time and then probably about two years ago I picked it back up because I wanted to get back into like, you know, fringe topics and stuff. I had kind of fallen out of the fringe areas. I just stopped listening because it just didn't seem... I graduated, I think, to the podcast, to the people that are yeah. really like mm -hmm. researching into these alternative topics. And, and... and maybe I'm a late graduate. <laughs> well, I don't know, oh, like... you know... I do think at some point you eschew mainstream sources, right? I mean, that just seems like a natural mm -hmm. progression for people that are into sure. this sort of field is just coast to coast. Like, I grew up listening to Art Bell in the 90s. Yeah. And, you know, He's that was great. responsible for my interest in, you know, expanding my worldview and, and reading and researching a lot on my own. Yeah. After a while, though, you realize they're just scratching the surface on this stuff. And mm -hmm. that's how I felt with George recently. It was just like, you know, I'm just not that interested in your angle on this anymore. There's there's a lot more depth here, and I have to find out. So from my perspective, I think he's a really skilled host, and that's probably why he's had the job that he's had for so long. I think it's much hard harder than people probably know to get people. For, and Art Bell was amazing. So it's also hard shoes to fill, I think, too. So that's one thing that's kind of up against Nori is, well, you know, the person before was Art Bell. But like you said, even Art Bell probably at a certain point, you know, like you said, lost steam. And then second of all, he is serving a certain audience that he has to serve. And it probably maybe as a gateway show does its job but then you know once you're past that first layer 
you, like you said, evolve, mature into deeper investigations, you know, and it's interesting you say, you know, real research that's going on, because I'm, I'm a, you know, still a huge fan of Nor, even if I find myself listening to Coast to Coast AM less, he's a really funny MC. he was really good at Alien Con, wrangling all the guests and getting them to say really great stuff and provoking the audience and the guests, and he was hilarious, off the cuff, completely off the cuff, witty, just g- genuinely entertaining guests. Guy. But yeah, um, real research. So although I'm a fan of these people and I love, you know, people like Linda Moulton Howell and, uh, you know, the Ancient Aliens crew, David Childress was really fun and seems just genuinely interested in this still day to day researching. At the same time, if you look at like the ground level of the less known people right now, less known people, you know, like me or like you even, um, or just all that you've, you've seen all these amateur YouTube amateur, you know, quotes, YouTube channels of people doing real live investigations, you know, following UFO sightings that are happening right now, following trends that are happening right now, or movements in disclosure or other paranormal topics, or not even disclosure of UFOs, but like, I'm sure you're familiar with occult topics. Uh, That is where like the real truth, you know, is coming out. You know, it's not coming out at these top levels. And I don't know if it's so much, like, by design or, like, so bad. Is is it just, like, is these people that have used to do real research day-to-day are now tied up. They're going to conferences. They have television shows. They have book signings. They have social – they have millions – not millions, but combined, you know, millions of followers – that they have to keep up with and maintain. So it just, it turns into a different level and a different thing, I think, at that point. I'm skeptical of anybody that gets on TV just because of the the very nature of TV is entertainment. Say what you will about Ancient Aliens from an entertainment perspective. It's an entertaining show, but are they... Are they talking about the truth? I don't think so. You know what I mean? Like, it just seems like they're not going to disclose anything on a TV show that's actually real and legitimate well so. and do you know who the true sponsor of ancient aliens is yeah as is alien con say what is now disney. do you know who the true sponsor of, of ancient aliens and alien cons is disney so disney owns history channel right as it does own marvel now right as it right. owns star wars <laughs> as it owns all you know the dot as it is the dominant market you know, in the children's film. So yeah. they're, you know, the biggest player in our future, if that makes sense. So Disney creates our future more so than studios that make films for adults. So if you look at the conditioning there, if you look at the conditioning in Ancient Aliens, because I am right there with you, with complete skepticism, there was some political talk at Alien Con. And I will not bring up politics here. Don't worry. <laughs> this is the extent of it. I won't even say what it was. Um, but it felt very, not rehearsed, but it felt very surface level analysis, you know, the situation. And maybe a little too hopeful in our politicians uh, to disclose the truth about UFOs to us. And for these same researchers who have been studying the cover up for years and years and years, to suddenly be so supportive of certain talking heads in the political arena who are saying they're going to bring out the truth. Right. And so just hopeful that that will happen and almost naive about it is a little off to me. And then also, though, separately, I think it's also um, a short, it's also short sighted to say that there is not truth being disclosed because I believe that it is. And I believe that, that the danger will be that there will be indeed be extremely real truths that have been and will continue to be revealed in ancient aliens programs. And that's why it will be so unstoppable. But the danger that it will be what a lot of people are worried about is that it will be a partial disclosure. Right. So we'll get some of the truth, but not all of the truth. And that just leaves a lot of open interpretation and a lot of room for manipulation and, and different groups trying to control the story. And so I think we can still watch these programs and learn from them, but we have to look at them very skeptically, like like you're doing. Well, I think you touched on a good point when you brought up Disney and 
you know, just general entertainment. And maybe I should backtrack on my statement about, well, they're not going to disclose any truth on TV. Because, yeah, you know, it's, it seems like there's probably some truth in all of Hollywood, you know, right? Like, you watch right. movies, and it's like, there are ideas in, like, some of these Marvel movies and, and some of these, you know, big-budget sci-fi movies that I'm sure are real and truthful, but they're presented as fiction, so you don't know from a two-hour film how much of that is true. You have to kind of pick and oh, choose, exactly. it, you know, what kind of makes sense. But mm-hmm. it, it's it's ridiculous. And so for somebody like me, who has decided to dedicate as much of my life as I can to this, genuinely, I feel like somebody like me can watch these movies and be able to watch them with the right mindset to where it's not going to brainwash me. Or confuse me too much, you know, because I have so much context and I am going to spend the night time connecting the dots. I just will. And I watch every single movie going into that. Like what, you know, if there could be some agenda behind it, if there's something that they're trying to say. So I'm very aware. But for the typical person who really should not be spending all their time doing this, they have other jobs, they have lives to lead that they should lead. How could they possibly know what's what? Like how, I mean, just how could, there's just no hours in the day to be able to, you know, connect all the dots and piece it all together. So, I mean, that's why it's important to write about it and make videos about it and try to tell people, you know, so that they can, it's kind of the shortcut, but it's still super difficult because that's not going to come from the mainstream. So it has to be sought out. By people who are kind of already aware. So I think it's it's tricky. It's very, very tricky trying to tell people how to watch these movies. Because frankly, I love Disney. And we own every single Disney movie. We've been collecting them since even before my son was born. (laughs) We love them. And, And almost every one of them has a really good message in it. That I can completely get behind as a parent. And I'll tell you, the movies from other studios, not so much. Yeah. Almost every time I can be sure. Despicable me? Really? <laughs> Look at the values in that. Yeah. Um, yeah. The latest Sing movie. Do you know what my son took away from that? The what? butt dancing. He didn't take away a single moral from that, but he did from Moana. He wasn't like, ta- you know, he remembered the music from Moana and the singing from Moana. And, uh, but in from the Sing movie, which is, I don't even know what studio, Warner Brothers, Nickelodeon, I don't even know. He took away the butt dancing. And I just know when I go into a non-Disney movie, there's not going to be a message about being a hero or, you know, doing the right thing in it. It's they're going to take away something else. It's going to be for the slapstick humor. You know, it's just fine. You know, like it's fine to enjoy that stuff. So it's a very, very strange, very strange thing that's going on here where you know in the background this is a studio with an agenda that probably absolutely, if it's possible, probably puts, if they can brainwash kids, you know they do. Yeah. And it may not even be positive. Well, <laughs> but I think the key is to watch it in an aware way. I know they've hooked several people, you know, with the Disney Channel shows. They had that run there where they had a bunch of popular shows, you know, like with Miley Cyrus and That's Amanda Bynes nice. and all that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. and... And no, what just, happens to those people after yeah, those shows? It's they, not they go, good. They go, not, pardon my language, but they go fucking crazy. And yes, no, yes, Britney Spears, yeah. Justin Timberlake's okay so far. And it just but, makes you wonder, like, you know, you, you read about MK Ultra and these CIA mind control programs, and then you start to see connections, like... Well, you know, there's a there's a Hollywood component to these programs with these famous actors and actresses and they're mostly child actors and then you yeah. see these these Disney they're child strange. actors that get super famous but then after 5 years of being famous they just go off the rails and you're mm-hmm. like that's that's not normal. Yeah, you know? and you can almost see the current group because I'm still in tune to all that stuff. Again, I have a well he just turned 5. And, you know, like I said, we love Disney. So I haven't been really, really watching the shows lately. And some of the shows, I'll say, are actually not as moral, if you will, as the movies. But honestly, still compared to other studios, they are. That's, And it could just be the lesser of two evils. Like, who knows what we're dealing with. But my, my whole take is that nobody controls my mind. I am who I am, and I enjoy whatever I want to enjoy. And it's up to me to project or put whatever I want onto it. 
you know, and if we go into anything, I think with that mindset, we can take the good from it and we can get rid of the bad. But if we go into things just completely naive and just assuming that mind control isn't real, you know, just assuming that these things are not possible, I just think we're sitting ducks. And then, of course, just balancing it out, just making sure... (laughs) that you're not um, only consuming one perspective is really important because, I mean, well, why why should you anyways with the internet? Well, let <laughs> the me... The way that it is, you know, yeah, there's just no reason I mean, to. Let me uh, just throw this out there. My day yeah. job is in marketing and advertising. Oh, I hear you. It's a <laughs> dirty industry and mind control is very real because mm-hmm. I spend my days... Unfortunately, trying to think of different ways to convince people to buy shit they don't need. Yep. So (laughs) when somebody says, well, research the psychology of marketing, you Mm -hmm. can delve into just some some subject like that and you'll see how how controllable the mind really is. Oh, yes. It's very responsive to certain words and color patterns and Mm -hmm. things like that. So. If we know that from a corporate marketing standpoint, then take that up the ladder. Everything would be trying to convince you to do something, to buy something, you know. So, but anyways, let's get to you. Let's get to Jane (laughs) Kyle, UFO researcher. I'm going to throw this out there, and I don't mean it to sound any certain way, but I don't see a lot of females researching UFOs, you know. (laughs) Oh, that doesn't mean anything. Yeah. So, it's true. <laughs> yeah. So how did you get into this field? Yeah. Well, and it's really funny to say that because guess who got in me into it? A man. <laughs> <laughs> My husband. So honestly, I've always been, I don't know if the term weird is right. But I've always just loved thinking and just losing myself in my thoughts and just been open-minded about everything. And I don't think I ever thought it was unbelievable that aliens could be real. But I never, I don't know, just thought to look into it for some reason. Um, Just probably because, as you know, there's, as we know, there's this huge cover-up going on. That's probably why. But my husband grew up fascinated in it, just finding books in the library as a kid um, that nobody else was you know, reading. And he just knew it was real from an early age. And so he just saw things from that perspective. And so when I met him, I, of course, just got into it. And I was just completely hooked. And so I, at the time, let's see, I'm trying to think exactly at the time. I didn't start this site, TexasUFOs.com, until 2012. But I did blog about these topics before under their various site domain names I was playing with, <laughs> you know, and kind of experimenting with at the time. So it actually started before, uh, but I majored in journalism in college. And then as you have a career in marketing and writing. And so for me, it was very natural to create a site and investigate these topics and write about them. That's just my wheelhouse. And it was also this huge void I just, I did, I've done fashion blogging, I've done (laughs) under a different, uh, let's just say I have uh, my name (laughs) for these topics and then I have a different name for my marketing (laughs) world, you know, but I have, um, just in case anybody tries to do research or anything like that, but I have done fashion blogging, I have done, let's see, I've done everything. I've written top articles about how to write a fence or things like that. And and any no matter what topic you can think about, food, clothes, anything, it's completely saturated. Totally saturated with everybody who is more of an expert on it than me. Even, you know, things that I love and have studied and almost got a degree in, like music. Uh, there's people who do it better than me. <laughs> but in this area you know, I'm good at research, and I'm good at writing. There's just, there's nothing happening, at least for Texas at the time, there wasn't. And so I started writing about it. And honestly, the community just created itself. And suddenly, I was obligated. (laughs) So that's really what happened. And it's just, it's continued to be, I only fall deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole in a good way. Things only get sharper and yet more complex and confusing. (laughs) over time and I would just never regret this path and what's interesting is it started off much more fringe 
much less competitive, like I was saying. And these days, and I mean this in a totally great way, it's so much more competitive, but it's amazing. <laughs> There's like so many UFO researchers now just deciding that's what they want to do. And I wish that there were more women in this world. And so that's actually one of my, of course, the number one thing is just to get the truth out about UFOs or, you know, whatever truth that is, get the facts out, you know, so people can figure out the truth, right? Right. But the other pet, I would love to get more women into this because I think they naturally would be and they just don't think that they would, would. You know, it's like the girl that's never played a video game and thinks it's just would be so boring. And then she finally plays and she finds a game she likes. Like there, this is a fascinating topic and women would just be just as interested in it as men, men. And I just don't think they've had that gateway, (laughs) like that coast to coast AM gateway we were talking about. Right. Yeah. I think girls who play video games are pretty sexy to be honest, but (laughs) Seek more wood if they tried. I think it's, I've seen that yeah. just a lot with like my female friends. They just don't know. They just haven't tried and they just make all these assumptions. And it's more, a lot of these things are more unisex <laughs> than we think. Yeah. And you know, anybody can have a blog now, you know, go to Blogspot, yeah. go to Blogger, just, just <laughs> create, cre- create a profile and you can be blogging about UFOs in 10 minutes. Yep. So. It's true. When you brought TexasUFOSightings.com online uh, in 2012, why did you Mm -hmm. create a a whole network for just Texas? So I started out with other domains, like I said. I don't honestly think, I don't remember exactly what it was. And it was a more national audience. And it was, as this one, you know, has been, it was just getting read like crazy. It's just a lot of traffic. So, um I'm trying to, but you know, it's interesting. I'm trying to think initially, I think what it was is there were were sightings happening in Texas and I wanted a way to talk about them too and not have to choose either or. And so that was, I was what prompted that change. So that way I could keep, I still write and I will be not yet be, be going uh, be finding a way to make it easier for people to find national topics versus Texas topics but right now <laughs> you know the home page is where I put all the latest and I continue to write about all the national topics and do all those or you know worldwide topics really and all those investigations but I wanted to be able to have a way to doc because I felt the most valuable thing I could do though was for the people in Texas, because I live in Texas, (laughs) and, you know, I can read their pulse, you know, week to week, and report on what they wanted to hear, and report on the stories that they really cared about and mattered, and I, and what it was, is I was getting reports from Texans, you know, and I still do, you know, every single week of UFOs, and so I had to have a place to put them, so it really kind of created itself, and just just kind of organically happened, I guess. So what sort of sightings have taken place recently sure. down there? Is there anything that stands out to you? Yeah. So Texas is a huge state. So that's the fortunate part, I guess, about covering any topic here. <laughs> it's just It just ends up getting super rich and complex. You know, sort of similar. It's similar to California. Or, you know, if you were to compare it to all of New England or something, right. um, it's just so unique. You know, El Paso sightings are honestly are different than sightings in Austin or sightings where there are airports and people sometimes mistake planes and things like that. But what's been happening lately in their sightings all the time? The biggest trend lately, and we're now are seeing reports of other UFO researchers about this, are the triangle crafts. So this started... And this last summer was when it really started. And I had never seen anything like it in my career or as a UFO researcher ever. Nonstop, really. Reports of triangle crafts, not just, just in Texas, but a lot in Texas, but also in Virginia. There were a lot when this started out in the Northeast and Maryland. Um, videos, photos, drawings. Detailed testimonies, all quite similar to each other. There were some differences. Some people described crafts they described as being transparent or going transparent. Others, I remember one of the better testimonies that had, I think it had a photo or video, you know, so it had some legitimacy to it or or multiple reports or something of of a craft wobbling as if, you know, it just been hit with something or was, you know, in trouble. 
Um, and so this is absolutely, there's absolutely no denying that it is happening and it's happening all over the world. One of the more credible sightings actually was aggressively debunked in, I can't, it wasn't in, in the U.S. I can't remember exactly what country, but I was even contacted about how it was a hoax and I just had still yet to see any evidence whatsoever it was a hoax. And it's also so similar to these other reports. So that started in the summer and continued at a very frequent rate up until really now. I feel like it's kind of slowed down in the last month to a, to a point that I can barely cover it or really don't cover it all because <laughs> it's so much and it's just completely, there's no doubt it's happening. And most reports are not coming from people where this is happening. So they're coming anonymously into MUFON. They've come across my site for the first time because they saw this. So it's not coming from, uh, you know, uh, these hoaxing YouTube channels. It's not coming from people who already believe in UFOs or have weird ideas. It's just coming from people just outside seeing these things. What were some of the, or what was the main reason that people said it was a hoax? So I'm trying to think, I don't know if it was Chile, it was some country. No, see, that's it. There was no reason. There wasn't one, as I kept thinking. (laughs) It was just, it was a hoax. It was a hoax. How can you believe this? It's just a lot of like generic comments and weird stories that didn't have any sources. And you know what? Maybe it was. And there was just not good reporting about it. I wasn't there. This was not a Texas event. It's a little easier when it's something happening in Texas because I can, you know, some, for example, there are hoax channels. And that that's why I really doubted it was a hoax. But there are some hoax channels, right, that will post UFO videos from Texas, apparently. And there will be these amazing crafts, you know, in these open areas. But I won't get a single report on my site about it. Not anything. (laughs) I, you know, I'll even, I remember I just got almost crucified for posting one of those videos. Because it would just kept making the rounds online and everybody was commenting on it. And I was like, well, I guess I have to post this. On my site, it's a Texas sighting. It seems like this maybe really happened. And my community, who are all in Texas, in this specific city, mind you, just roasted me. Because they were like, this never happened. This was a hoax. Why are you even promoting this? And if I hear about the blimp in that city or (laughs) the fireworks, why am I not, you know, if if on 4th of July, I get, I know I'm going to get like several (laughs) reports. I mean, dozens of reports about UFOs because of the fireworks why am i not getting a report about this massive cube shaped black object in the sky hovering over a city like it just makes no sense so in those cases and that's why i like focusing on texas because that's where i can do the real research and really truly honestly be able to say i can report the truth to my audience so how many cases of these dark triangle ufos have you seen in texas recently it's been dozens i mean because it began in the summer and it's i basically see reports every week now it wasn't like there weren't triangle reports before so some of those could be misidentification some of those could be the same you know number of ufos we would have seen anyways that's just natural anytime you have a massive thing like this you just get other kind of junk in it (laughs) but you know i'm looking back let's see all the way back Through December, I documented, it looks like at least, or through November, at least 10 sightings of triangle crafts, you know, that were just documented, you know, from me, from Texas. And that's not including ones, you know, I didn't have time to report on. That's not including the worldwide sightings I also helped to document. There's one in January in Brazil that we don't have a video of, but we have a photo of. And then the witness said there was also a crop circle that came up nearby, curiously enough. During the same time range. So it's it's pretty bizarre. One triangle craft was seen near the Wright-Patterson Air Force, which many may know is uh, rumored to be the place that all the top secret ET cr- you know, crafts and, and tech are located. I live like 40 minutes from Wright-Pat. Oh, wow. Do you ever see anything? You know, oddly enough, not really. There's been some weird air traffic through there the past couple of months. It's just been a little heavier in terms of helicopters and big like carrier jets flying in and out. But in terms of UFOs, I've only seen one recently. It was last either August or September. It was late summer. 
but it wasn't near Wright Pat. It was about 20 to 30 minutes away from Wright Pat. You know, I live in the Dayton area, so it wasn't very exciting. It was, it <laughs> seemed more like a vertical craft. Does that make sense? Yeah. It was, it seemed like a, it was just kind of like a long and slender. And, and I only saw it for yeah. about a half a second and then it disappeared. And mm-hmm. it was in the middle of the day. I was actually driving home from work. You know, it was probably like 5.30 p.m. Yeah. And I don't know. It's it's the only UFO sighting I've had recently. So I can't really say much more about that. But uh, Right. And they're normally not that exciting. Yeah. I was just like. <laughs> I was driving and then I, I, I saw it and then I came to a, like a stoplight and I was like thinking about it and I texted a girlfriend of mine and I was like, hey, I just saw a UFO and that was it. Like I, we, we didn't talk about it. It was just like, uh-huh, huh. So that happened. Uh-huh. And yeah. I, I didn't really see it. You know, to be honest, I didn't really care about it. I didn't even follow uh-huh. up like and see if anybody else saw I, it on, you know, like if somebody did. posted about it. I just didn't really mm-hmm. care. I was like, you know, UFOs are real. We know that there's unidentified flying objects. <laughs> Like, what am I supposed to do, you know? No, it's true. And I don't think most people do report it. I think there's a common myth that it's like, well, UFOs are real. Why wouldn't we have more evidence? We do. We have lots of evidence. It's kind of phenomenal. And basically, 99% of it doesn't get reported. And when it does, it usually will always get debunked. So I would ask everybody listening, the next time Fox News reports on a wonderful UFO sighting, Just give it a few days and it will get debunked. This is the same way for scientific breakthroughs or there's water on Mars. No, there's not. There's water on Mars. No, there's not. There's water on Mars. Okay, yeah, actually, I think there is this time. (laughs) Like, this is just how the media works. Right. Um, And it's just this, like, slow drip. And I think the problem is we're expecting UFOs to be a certain way. And to appear a certain way to us instead of expecting that if there are UFOs and a and especially if there are ET beings um, responsible for them, we're not really going to know what they're supposed to be like. Um, the lady, the latest theory is that they're interdimensional, which makes a lot of sense with disappearing and reappearing. And perhaps they don't want to be seen, which makes a lot of sense. So I think there's a lot of just kind of myths about UFOs. And at the same time, it appears back in the day, the more stereotypical, typical flying saucer was seen and was a phenomenon but that also sort of would make sense that these days we would see something different maybe even something less assuming or more appropriate for espionage (laughs) or abducting people (laughs) you know who knows if you look at the trend with our own man-made human technology i mean there's obviously a high probability that these are just government crafts yes so high 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 probability That is, I would say that's the most popular theory right now, is that these are, I don't want to say it wrong, it's TR-3B, I think is the right. Oh, right, right. Now, yeah, we're talking about the triangle crafts. Yeah, the triangle crafts. Mm -hmm. Those are government planes, or it could be that they are government crafts now, but weren't then. So it's because if... The theory goes that we reverse engineered crafts that we found. So in a way, showcasing our own crafts that are based on ancient or even recent alien tech, who knows, is almost a form of disclosure. So it's a strange, it just kind of keeps begging questions when you imagine that these same craft, if it is government planes, and that's the only theory we go on, then we know these government planes were being operated during the time of Roswell. Might have been even more high tech than what we're seeing now, which is weird to think about. And we're then, that was the Phoenix Lights then. So we were operating these triangle crafts, you know, in the 90s. And what, 2017, the general pop- population is only just now finding out about them. So it's this, you know, what, how much more, <laughs> you know, tech, what is the craft that they're working on now that's top secret? If triangle crafts are now just going to be an accepted thing. Well, what is, <laughs> what is you know, a Wright Patterson or Area 51 or whatever the new, you know, the new place is? Yeah, that's, that's very similar to like when Lockheed introduced the SR-71 Blackbird. And Lockheed, of course, is at the center of a lot of this, so. <laughs> yeah. And that we just see that over and over and over again with everything, you know, and it's just like how many medical, scientific, technological breakthroughs is the government just sitting on? Um, I just did a video on YouTube that 
has gotten a good amount of views and traction, so I'm pleased for that, that the word's getting out. But I don't know if you're familiar with the latest documents that were dumped onto the CIA website. You know, I haven't read much about it. I did see that it happened, yeah. Yeah. Well, they've been, I mean, they've been putting documents there for a while. They had a blog, I I blogged about their blog, <laughs> um, about um, the X-Files, their X-Files that they were opening up and were kind of, you know, tongue-in-cheek about it. They wrote an article about how to investigate a flying saucer, and it was actually a uh, very serious article, like, with very real tips. Like, I would give it to a wannabe <laughs> ufologist, like, MUFON could use it. I just thought that was just amazing, and that's one of the reasons, too, I felt so much better about going forward with the site and everything too is like okay CIA is telling me to I guess this is not gonna be this is gonna be a thing now this is gonna be popular apparently so they've been dropping documents for a while and the latest of these well there were a number of them and I didn't the one that got covered the least by the mainstream media was the Stargate project files and now start the Stargate project is not something that Every you know, it's something that people have known about for a while. It's been unclassified for a while. You can find a really good Wikipedia article on it. But this is the first time the actual documents were actually dropped. And of course, you know, they tell a slightly different story, you know, than the public story of that top secret organization. So it's necessary really to understand it. But anyways, the Stargate project was a thirty year program lasting from the seventies to the nineties. Um, supposedly it shut down in the 90s. You could say maybe it just went a little more underground, but I think it's possible it really did shut down. And it was a remote viewing slash, you know, psychic program. And they investigated it. They experimented on it. Uh, There's a lot of essays on in these files. They studied it. They did actually use it. So it wasn't just a theory or or they try, you know, they maybe they used it just alongside the real military efforts. They used they tried to locate you can find in these documents William Buckley, who was a CIA operative who was kidnapped and tortured and did eventually die. It does appear that these remote viewers could have been correct. I didn't read every single word, but it, they didn't have good prospects for him, but it wasn't, it, clearly they weren't able to save him. So that was sad. That's a sad part of it. So that could be one of the reasons it was discontinued in the 90s. Because, it, But it does appear that the government believed it to be real, really had no doubts that it was real, and that the psychic phenomenon was real, and had the potential to yield results. But it appears that indeed it could have been difficult to control, and it maybe wasn't super effective or cost-effective, because you'd have to have multiple remote viewers to do this in an ex- experiment on. Um, so this was, going back to what we were talking about, this is the 70s to 90s that the government was experimenting with psychic ability. So, you know, behind our yeah. backs, they're doing this. And then, and then they're, you know, um, in the mainstream media, which, the, you know, we know the government influences, they're saying this stuff is bull crap, and it's all relegated to psychic, you know, silly psychic shows and, um, you know, fortune tellers and things. It's just this amazing disconnect between what the government really knows and what they're really doing. You can only imagine how much more advanced. And it does appear that they were motivated, and this is similar to UFOs, and they're interested in UFOs, um, motivated to do this program because of Russia and well, and the, the KGB. Because they believed that foreign enemies were experimenting with these methods successfully. And so that was one of the motivators. That's something else you can get out of the documents. Um, but I will say the most fun thing about it, and this is what I made the video about. <laughs> um, but you don't even have to watch the video. I'll just, I'll just spoil it for you. <laughs> do it. Spoiler um, alert. Go ahead. There was... Are you familiar with Close Encounters of the Third Kind? The oh, yeah. Movie? For yeah. sure. So as you recall, um, Richard Dreyfus has visions after the UFO. I don't know if you remember the exact detail, but mm-hmm. it's the Devil's Tower, Mountain Butte in Wyoming, yeah. it turns out. Oh, shoot. I don't want to. I don't know if you're going to have to edit. A lot of things are said That's fine. in this podcast. I do not want to... Uh, um, it's really most people have seen it that are into this topic though, and it's a pretty old film. Yeah, edit if you need to, or you know, put a spoil, you know, a spoiler alert. Right. Go ahead. Um, yes. So that is a plot line in the film, and we all, some of us, are aware that Steven Spielberg is kind of rumored to 
maybe know something, you know, when making Close Encounters and E.T. Now, in these documents, which officially it looks like the Stargate project was given its name in 1978, but the program started earlier under uh, Project Sunstreak, I think. There is a document, and it, I know because I've looked at all the other documents, but it's clearly, clearly a remote viewing session. And so the first document, you know, it's a photocopy. There's no date on it. So we have no idea when the session was conducted. It could have been right when the movie was coming out. It could have been right before, right after. We don't know. No date on it. It's a picture of the Devil's Tower in Wyoming. And then the document below that is a clay model of the Devil's Tower. So clearly this was a remote viewing session where someone was given clay and they had a picture of that mountain view in the envelope for that person to mold and see in their head. So clearly it was a successful experiment. Now there's no, maybe if I search some more, I'll be able to find some analysis. There's literally 600 URLs to click through of documents, not 600 documents, 600 URLs. And there's no easy way to search. Some are handwritten. So it's, I will continue to find things, but there is literally a remote viewing session that's being conducted by the government alongside similar time range as this movie as they we're hearing the same story of a vision. And there's been lots of stuff about Close Encounters being a um, possibly rooted in a real story. There's been lots of that um, that's come out over the years. So I thought that was a pretty interesting turn of events. And that document's only been available, you know, to the public for the past, like, month, basically. It's totally new yeah, to the world. You know, I... I think people would be surprised to know where their tax dollars are going into right. these fields of research. Like, I just talked to somebody. Well, budget is huge. <laughs> yeah, like I, I just uploaded a show with uh, a guy who is a former contractor, and he worked out in New Mexico at Los Alamos Lab uh -huh. and Sandia Labs. Uh -huh. These are Department of Energy research facilities. And he's, mm -hmm. he's a private contractor, and, and he's telling me, he wrote a book, it's a novel, but it's based on his experiences out there. The stuff that he was talking about that they're researching out there, you know, and it's speculative because he was just a contractor. He wasn't like the actual guy researching it, but he made mm -hmm. friends with a physicist out there. And the yeah. physicist was essentially like a whistleblower. Wow. Yeah, you'll have to listen to the show, but... I definitely will. The, the subjects that they're researching and the money that gets poured into these fields of scientific research, like I'm talking things like quantum physics, people just don't realize they're spending billions of dollars researching these things. And I can't yeah. imagine remote viewing research is any different, you know? Yeah, and, and why are we going to – and no offense to TED Talks. I love TED Talks. They're really entertaining. But the mainstream story of, sci of story of science and what's possible just seems so outdated to me, you know? And I'm just ready, you know, to get beyond the theory of it. And we're still theorizing – about whether these things are real in the mainstream. You know, and I'm ready to get beyond the theory. <laughs> and if the government hadn't been so secret, and, and it's not just that nobody's, I've thought about this a lot. It's not that I'm glad, kind of, you know, that the government has, in a lot of ways, I'm glad they have some black budget money reserved to explore these things. And I do understand some of the classified nature, especially as it has to do with UFOs, because that has to do with national security, um, who knows? You know, who knows what's at stake? However, it's one thing to conduct secret experiments. It's another thing to lead the public to believe none of that's real. Because to me, that's dishonest. And you're preventing so much evolution in society when they're just told these things are fantasy instead of being given the opportunity to be like, well, maybe these things are real. Maybe we don't. Maybe it's not like the extremists. <laughs> You know, on YouTube, where, um, I don't know, I just, I read a lot of silly things. To me, it seems silly, no offense, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm the one that's behind. But you just see a lot of people just acting as if they know everything there is to know about the psychic phenomenon. And I just think it's a lot messier than that. And if we could all just accept it was real and just work together to understand it in a scientific way, we would get so much farther. Absolutely. Yeah, I would agree with that. You did mention Roswell earlier. I wanted to circle back to something about Roswell because I read an article recently that you wrote for Collective Evolution after you got back from AlienCon. 
you were writing about the connection between Roswell and Rendlesham Forest and Egyptian hieroglyphs. Could you maybe take us through that connection? Yeah, I was excited to attend that panel. I mean, I knew it would be interesting. So the panel was uh, the Marcel family, these two brothers and a sister, I believe. And they're the grandchildren of the general who's seen that some people have seen that famous photo of the man holding well it looks like foil um at the roswell crash site so that man they're his grandchildren so obviously you know this was a top secret ordeal you know no matter what your theories on it it was definitely top secret it's not that the grandfather gave these children all this information but he did give them some and then they actually continued to investigate this after he passed and so these this panel was about some of the latest revelations in their their own independent investigation and I was actually able to ask some questions <laughs> so that's how I was able to get to some some of this so according to them and we actually have seen rumors and reports of this before this panel but it was just sort of a nice extra validation but according to the grandchildren, at the crash site, uh, there was, so this man, you know, their their grandfather was in charge of collecting the debris at the cra- crash site. So, you know, to back it up, essentially there was a pod that crashed in one direction, and then there was uh, another aircraft that went into a different direction. And so that's what this gentleman was picking up, was not, he was not involved in the pod. So although it was in pieces, it they because they messed with it, <laughs> they experimented with it. Him and his, uh, there was I think at least one other uh, man with him helping him. They messed with it. They couldn't destroy it, no matter what they did to it, no matter how they bent it, it would move back in shape. So it was like this memory <laughs> material, and they also noticed hieroglyphics, like weird Egyptian-like hieroglyphics on the debris. That is something that we hear time and time again from some of the more well-documented UFO sightings. And the Rendlesham UFO incident in the UK is an example of that, of hieroglyphics that were seen on that craft by that military personnel in the UK. So that was really interesting, that connection. And as far as I can know, a lot of those findings at least um i think we've heard bits and pieces of all of that you know that there were hieroglyphics or that the uh, material like had this strange memory to it also it was like lightweight it looked like it could just float if you dropped it so strange just dynamic properties and of course i've researched other elements of the roswell case um i've covered robert porter a gentleman that was in charge of flying the Roswell wreckage from Roswell to Fort Worth, Texas, actually, before it was then, I believe, taken to Wright-Patterson, so near you. So it came near me. <laughs> it was flown near near my neck of the woods and then taken to you. Right. Um, so it was a long journey for a weather balloon. <laughs> well, as far as the hieroglyphics are concerned, what are some of the theories as to what they might mean? What, and one thing that they saw that also was seen in the Rendlesham I believe it's a triangle with a dark colored, solid color ball at the top. And that was something apparently that was seen at Rendlesham and Roswell. And so we see a lot of that triangle pyramid symbolism. And of course, we know where the pyramids come from, or at least, you know, history tells us where the pyramids come from. Even if it's, you know, foreign governments or in a government creating these crafts, there seems to be something very rooted in our subconscious with that triangle and that pyramid. I mean, it is associated with the Illuminati, but I think that's too easy. It's like some sense of homeland or something. It's not that the the pyramids were just in Egypt. You know, we have this trend in construction all around the world over different periods of time. You know, this is something very human. Once you start interpreting, it's hard not, I mean, you get super speculative. I think you just cannot not speculate and start sounding like an ancient aliens cast member. Well, hey, (laughs) let me interject some interesting theory into this about these hieroglyphics. So I'd love to hear it. I uh, did some research on this after I read your article. And this this article came out right. on Collective Evolution, uh, I think, back in December. So this was a couple of months ago. But Yeah, the panel was in October. Right. I did some research, and I didn't bookmark the site at first. So in preparation <laughs> for the interview, I had to, like, retrace my steps. And I found yeah. what I was looking for. And <laughs> this is an old Angel Fire website. Do you remember Angel Fire? Yeah. 
I from... do. <laughs> okay, so I found this on an old Angel Fire <laughs> website, but it's super interesting. And I might just have to read verbatim from this, but... Go for it. I'd love I'm, to hear I'm going to inject a theory here as to what these hieroglyphs may mean. So uh-huh. on this Angel Fire website, and I'll link to it in the show notes, there are 10 hieroglyphs lined up, right, across mm-hmm. from left to right. And this is from the drawing that Jesse Marcel made. Now, the site then numbers the hieroglyphs 1 through 10 and then makes a link to images in a book called Modern College Physics by Dr. Harvey White. And in this book, there are diagrams of electron clouds in hydrogen atoms. Mm -hmm. And some of them are very similar to the hieroglyphs that were found on the Roswell debris and the Rendlesham as well. And there are... That's super interesting. Yeah, so there are... Let's see here. There are three of them that look exactly like one of the wave patterns diagrammed in this physics book. There's one other one that looks like another wave pattern, and then there's two other ones that look like a third. So one, two, three, four... Five, six of the ten hieroglyphs look like three of the wave patterns diagrammed in a quantum physics book. Quantum physics. Yes, quantum physics. So yeah. this <laughs> this is super interesting to me uh-huh. because... I'm so happy that you found that and are sharing that. You know, it's hard to do it. It's hard to talk about it without looking sure. at it, obviously. Yeah, I'm like, just keep my eyes keep looking up in my head. Actually, like... <laughs> okay, <laughs> Imagining you know what? These- I don't know why I'm, I, I'm on Skype with you. I could just send this to you. Hold on. Let me figure out how to send you a message while we're talking. Okay, so I just shared that link with you. Send it. And if you scroll, yeah, it's just right at the top. Like, if you scroll down, you'll see, like, the second paragraph talks about this. There's this other book. Gary Zukov writes this book. Oh, and yeah. then in his book, he shares a series of illustrations from this other textbook on quantum physics, which I was just talking about. Oh, yeah. So you'll see these cool. these mm-hmm. wave patterns, these electron clouds, and then you'll scroll down and you'll see the Marcel drawings right underneath that. And then you'll see them labeled 1 to 10. And then you'll see the correlation made between three of them to one diagram, one of them to a second diagram, and two more to uh-huh. a third diagram. Yeah, that's super interesting. It, it makes sense to... Like it's a it's a theory that would make sense too, just because. So even speaking of the triangle, it's all geometry, and there's you know the a whole group of people you know like follow sacred geometry. You know we see in crop circles, and it has it always has is rooted in some math and some power, <laughs> you know some truth, like some science, if if you will. So this is cool. Like this is really cool. Well, we also know that the keepers of sacred knowledge, you know, whether it's secret societies that we've known about, the language has always spoken across history through symbols. Right. So it makes sense that if you find debris from a UFO crash site, that there's not going to be words written on it. It's going to be symbols because that's right. that's a common thread throughout history is that symbolic language is the, the knowledge that's been passed down. You know, it, the spoken word is one thing. The written word is another thing. But when you really want to convey meaning to, to something, it's through symbols. And we, we know that from things just like corporate logos, you know, or yep. this occult symbolism that, that you may see, you know, thrown about. Yeah, so the, the quantum angle to this makes a lot more sense to me sure because does. I've thought more recently about UFOs being just maybe like a, a projection of human consciousness, you know, and, and if you wanted to that's go... Very do... pop- that's becoming an increasingly yeah. popular theory. Yeah, and I talked at I talked at length about it on a, a previous episode of the show with uh, Ryan Sprague. I don't know if you know Ryan Sprague. He's in like the Richard Dolan community of of UFO right. researchers, and he just put out a book last fall or last winter. Mm-hmm. And but anyways, so the hieroglyph connection between Roswell and Mendelssohn is interesting. Just hieroglyphs in general have always been mm-hmm. you know really thought provoking ideas and. You know, speaking of corporate logos, though, I stumbled across an old article that you wrote for your website about the Black Knight satellite and this <laughs> short film that Pepsi made a few years ago. Yeah. And I'm going to be honest with you. I completely missed this short film that Pepsi made. No, and now it's private. They made it private now. You can't even watch it. Well, I actually saw some other YouTube channels that oh, had it on. So. Good. 
good. What is it, about 10 minutes long or so? I mean, it's... Yeah, I don't remember it being... I mean, I obviously watched it, so it couldn't have been that long. (laughs) I don't think I would have stuck an hour in the Pepsi-sponsored film. But yeah, the official YouTube video from, I guess, the Pepsi channel or who, you know, whoever is private now. So they didn't take it down, but... You know, it's private. Right. So the film was called Black Knight Decoded. I know what the Black Knight satellite is or what it's hypothesized to be, but the fact that Pepsi made a short film about it just blew my mind. Could you maybe Mm -hmm. talk about, you know, what the Black Knight satellite is and, and what this short film was about? Yeah. So, okay. So the Black Knight satellite is... It's just, it's sort of taken a life on its own. It has its own Wikipedia page. It's um, a bunch of, you know, just like Bigfoot and just UFOs in general. Everybody has an opinion about it or whether or not it's real. But um, there is a photo of it so-called on NASA website. And and NASA website, they just refer to it as space debris. It is pretty interesting and intricate. Uh, space debris it's one of the more interesting space photos i've seen and that's considering there's been a lot lately and that was i think 1990s that that photo was taken but this really goes back to nikola tesla who was an you know inventor engineer and he apparently discovered or you know speculated that there was a 13,000 year old satellite that was, you know, not made by us here on Earth orbiting the planet. And there were also other reports and accounts of a similarly, you know, exotic satellite or craft orbiting the Earth from other different countries and people over the years ever since. And so the leading, you know, skeptical way to debunk it is that, well, there were some just kind of various things, you know, that were reported, and maybe they were spy satellites, you know, from other countries. That's just, we'll see that as a continuing pattern, (laughs) debunking ET and UFOs, just to say they're, you know, our own. So there were a lot of different, you know, stories and accounts of this that sort of then blended together into this Black Knight satellite story. And then, of course, some people believe, of course, that Tesla was just completely right, and this whole you know, crazy story is really more, you know, of a crazy cover-up, as does happen. I mean, that is just the truth. All of these, you know, real stories that we know to be real now, like Rendlesham, there is always an effort to report it as a hoax first, because that's, you know, the all, what can you do <laughs> when something gets out and is real and, and you, you know you can't stop it? That's the easiest thing to do is just say it's a hoax. So Black Knight definitely lives in that world right now. So that's why it's interesting that Pepsi, why Pepsi, (laughs) would make a whole fiction movie about this on YouTube, give it away for free to people. Um, I watched, I don't remember it it, uh, promoting Pepsi at all. I don't remember, uh, it just made no sense. There wasn't really product placement at all. It was messaging. It was messaging (laughs) about the Black Knight satellite and, and UFOs. And at the heart of it, to me, because I was researching into the, like you were transitioning with the Pepsi logo, corporate logos, Pepsi logo changed its logo in 2009. So, you know, quite a bit ago, but I was just trying to look at, you know, why would Pepsi make a movie about this? And in 2009, they changed their logo. And you just have to see it, but it was very, very subtle. But for this tiny, tiny, tiny subtle logo change that some people may not even notice, they published, like, a huge, like, number of docket pages explaining the message of the logo and relating it to the theory of relativity and geodynamics and all the Earth's magnetic field. Yeah, let let me quote you from your own article. They released a 27-page document about what the new logo meant. In addition to the red, white, and blue colors that resemble the American flag, the logo also symbolizes the Earth's magnetic field, feng shui, Pythagoras, geodynamics, and the theory of relativity. What the hell is that? <laughs> why is a beverage this? Why is a beverage company taking this logo business so seriously? Well, then you dig right. into logos, you know, a little more, and and you see again how powerful symbols and symbology has been throughout history. So. The fact that they redesigned their logo is not that interesting. The fact that it means what they said it means in their own document dump about it is really interesting. Yeah, it's so strange. Yeah, yeah. what are they trying to get across to people? Yeah, and then uh, what was yeah. it, who was it? The um, 
the president of PepsiCo was the executive producer on this short film about the Black Knight satellite. That's the connection. It, it uh-huh. might not have been actually like produced by Pepsi with their money. Right. And there was definitely no product placement in it. Mm-mm. But the fact that the, the executive producer was the president of PepsiCo... <laughs> What is he what, doing? <laughs> yeah, what? why? Like, what? I and then just... why make it private? That's the other thing. And then why all of a sudden is it a private video now, too? You know, because if you're doing it for views or to just to participate in disclosure and UFOs, right. well, why not actually do that then <laughs> instead of letting other people? And what's interesting is Pepsi's halftime show just updated an article from last year just about Super Bowls and just their track record with their halftime shows and their commercials. <laughs> There's yeah. usually, you know, something weird. Yeah, the Super Bowl halftime show the last few years, you know, the acts that they've gotten are acts that are in conspiracy circles very directly linked to this Illuminati group. And these symbolic performances are, are always interesting to watch. Yeah, but and it's I, the, you know, oh, I really but... struggle with the, like, accusing people, you know, performers or anybody of being in the Illuminati. Because I feel like that's a really big, like, accusation. <laughs> so I try really hard to, like, always... I guess, you know, debunk these things, if you will. But at at a certain point, it just, it happens over and over and over again. And I would just definitely say people be careful as they watch these things. I don't think there's any harm in that. Yeah, and back to the Black Knight satellite real quick. One of the more interesting things about that story is the connection it has to Philip K. Dick. Do you know that? I don't. Hmm, okay. I don't know if I was prepared to explain it, but the connection to the Black Knight satellite and Philip K. Dick is, you know, he wrote this book in 1980 called Valus, and Uh it's widely considered his best book, I guess, or his, his magnum opus, if you will. And in the book, he details this experience that he had in, I think it was 1974, he has this this weird experience where a young female comes to his house and gives him some sort of package. But mm-hmm. while she's delivering the package to him, he's drawn to this necklace that she's wearing. It's a gold necklace and it has a pendant on it that is like a fish shape. And it's the middle of the day. And while he's standing there in the doorway, like interacting with this woman, the sun catches that pendant and the glare that comes from the pendant hits him right in the eyes. Mm-hmm. And he called it a pink beam of light. And he said that in that moment, it was almost like a download of a bunch of information. Oh, wow. He claimed that this pink beam of light just gave him some sort of revelation of sorts. And said that this was the most transformative event of his life. Now, wow. the link to the Black Knight satellite is that many people have tied that beam of light directly from the Black Knight. Mm, like reflected off of it? No, like it was like... like came from it. Yeah, yeah, it came from it. Because I guess the satellite actually has a reddish, pinkish hue to it in some mm-hmm. photos. And the mm-hmm. book that he wrote then about this experience called Valus, Valus stands for Vast Active Living Intelligence System. <clears throat> it's essentially autobiographical, and it's about... A writer, I think he actually uses himself. So so it's about this guy, you know, Philip K. Dick, who is in communication with essentially a living intelligence organism in outer space. The connection there is very interesting. It's it's the most, I think, mainstream explanation of what the satellite is veiled in fiction, you know, through this guy's own personal experience. So there's nothing more to the story in that. Like, actually, there's a lot more to it, but I'm, I can't really summarize it all. I just have a few notes on it. But it was interesting that I was poking through your website. I saw the article about the Pepsi short film, and that reignited my curiosity about the Black Knight satellite. And then I remembered the Valus book, so I had to do some more research on that. But yeah, so anyways... What are some of the most memorable cases in Texas of UFO sightings that you've seen? I mean, there's been a lot. You know, lately there's been some more alien abduction accounts lately. So even if you think that they're um, all dreams, it's still interesting. There's been a spike. So, you know, there's always super interesting things happening. But I would say there sticks out to me are waves. Like, you know, I know this triangle wave right now is going to stick out to me in the future. But in Houston, and I want to say it was 2014, there were a lot of sightings of, like, a ring of lights. 
so much so that you could almost debunk it as a street light, but I mean, it definitely wasn't. I mean, it was like case after case where we deep, I was able to know for sure it was not a street light. So it's like this not flying saucer and more circular than that. You like spaceship looking thing <laughs> that was just seen for a period of months just all over the Houston area and just reported and reported and never got any mainstream coverage. Um, well, actually got a little bit, tiny bit of mainstream coverage in the local, not local news, you know. And so that really sticks out to me. And honestly, it was never really solved. You know, <laughs> it was just kind of stopped happening. Now, you did get some junk mixed in with it, as is, as is with any of these waves. I mean, worldwide, there's probably a little more that, that stand out. As you're saying, you know, I in Texas, you know, if, you, if you're living in a city, you want to hear, honestly, you wouldn't even know if there's spy drones in your area. You're really invested and it gets kind of nerdy and technical. And But as far as this just sensational, just amazing sightings, you know, those tend to channel up, you know, at the worldwide level. And I would say my favorite type of sighting to cover that just keeps happening is related to the phenomenon of ball lightning and earthquakes. So we just see all the time in Mexico, so, you know, nearby Texas, uh, Mexico, but just places with volcanoes. We see, and this is something I've seen with my own two eyes, by the way, on a Jap- Japanese uh, or Japan volcano camp. Lights hovering around the volcanoes, going in and out of them, sometimes seeming to move intelligently, you know, getting bigger, shrinking. And so this is a volcano, you know, phenomenon. And there was a really nice sighting in Mexico recently that was captured on a webcam. And we also see similar, similarly when there are um, earthquakes or, um, you know, anything with the tectonic plates. So, you know, volcanic activity, we see a phenomenon called earthquake lights. And so something with the, the fixture, you know, the fissure, you know, in the, in the earth, you know, causes this energy, I guess you could say. We know ball lightning is a real phenomenon. So both earthquake lights and then ball lightning, which tends to happen in thunderstorms, and that can create these really giant balls of light that are actually quite scary. (laughs) You know, if you don't know what you're looking at. And honestly, it could be dangerous for all we know. And these, both these phenomena were denied by mainstream science because they were so, only the UFO community was really talking about them. And so those are some of my favorite sightings to report on because I think that it has to do with some, you know, we're talking about the hieroglyphics and what they mean and secret knowledge. And I think it has something to do with ways we can utilize the energy that's already on our planet for, you know, all of us. Free energy is the, you know, the modern day buzzword, (laughs) I guess, for that. You know, that was a, a Tesla kind of brainchild. So he experimented with ball lightning so i don't see that as much in texas i know that was your question um but to me that really sticks out it's been a a theme throughout my investigation because that you can never debunk those sightings they're really happening and what does it mean um sometimes they do appear to dance and be intelligent so what does that mean you know what is this they seem to spy or even show up and survey natural disasters we have like drones sometimes these same weird balls of light that show up and seem completely almost organic and not intelligent at a, during an earthquake will then during the same earthquake appear later and seem intelligent. It's very strange and it appears to be a very real phenomenon that's happening. Um, so I, I enjoy covering that. The Japan earthquake, you know, and tsunami in Fukushima um, was just, it was a, ma- a crazy time for sightings. And uh, in Mexico, in some places, they call them spirit orbs. So they actually think it's souls, uh, souls passing on to the next life. Oh, that's a cool theory. So mm-hmm. hey, what about this recent sighting in Humble about this mystery star that yeah. moves? Okay, so yeah, so actually that, and I actually plan to do some follow up on that one. Because um, that is a common theme, really, actually. And it does seem to happen certain times a year. Maybe certain times a year when there's a cool constellation, I don't know, and people are looking up. I don't know. And this might be specific to Texas. Of people seeing, they'll look up and it would be extremely bright star. And it's just pretty, oh, look at that star. And then it will start changing colors, um, growing in size or shrinking. Now, if that's all it does, it could be just an optical illusion. You know, and even satellites and stars will flicker other colors. They're not always just like gold or yellow. 
But then when that star starts to move, <laughs> it sort of escapes all explanation. And this happens. This this happens um, a lot. You know, sometimes maybe it's a drone or um, it could be an opt- You know, if a plane is incoming at you for a long time, you're going to think it's hovering a light. It's a hovering light. And then suddenly it turns and you're like, oh, no, that's a UFO. <laughs> Uh, but this sighting in Humble, which I got, and then others actually I've seen recently around the same time period. And that is how these sightings tend to get reported. These star-like objects that move do tend to get seen by m- multiple people at a time. So that's kind of, in- that's interesting. You know, one false identification one night, that makes sense. But when multiple people are writing in about it, you tend to think, well, is this, e- even sometimes I get reports of, I think, what are, what maybe are new stars appear, new stars. Or stars dying. You know, it looks like a star and then suddenly it doesn't. (laughs) Well, maybe, you know, it was a star and now it's transitioned and you got to witness that. Well, this might be a weird request, but could you maybe read the report from the star that you got? No, I totally understand. I I do that with videos um, a lot. Just, yeah. Okay, so this is January 30th, 2017. Last night around 10.30, my son, age 24, stepped out in the backyard and spotted something moving northward across the sky. It then stopped and started moving in circles. While moving in circles, it would occasionally dart to the left or the right in quick movements. It continued its movement toward the north, but not in alignment with the stars. It looked very much like a star, but it was much brighter, and occasionally it changed from a bluish white to red to green. He called me outside, so he, my son, called me outside to observe it with him. I finally had to go to bed. Tonight, January 30th, 2017, I stepped back outside to contemplate what I had seen the night before and to check to see if it was still up there. Perhaps it really had been a star. Instead, I saw the same object again. This time, it was a bit further south and closer to the horizon. I live in Humble, Texas and was looking west towards Spring, Texas. I am aware that there are several planets that are very bright in the night sky and I live near the airport, so I continued to watch it to see if it might be an airplane or planet. Again, it moved much faster than the night sky, but not at all like an airplane or helicopter. It was lower to the horizon tonight, and it continued to descend downward while making circular movements. Occasionally, it darted back and forth, but its primary movement was downward towards the horizon. Since I have a large set of trees, a.k.a. mini forest, behind my backyard, I was unable to track it all the way to the ground. It disappeared behind the trees, and I did not see it anywhere. There was no sound as far as I could tell. So that was from Humble, Texas, which is north of Houston. So Houston is a hotbed for sightings. Well, there's a lot of people (laughs) and there's an airport. But that one definitely, even though we just got, you know, a video, the video shows, you know, this star-like object. Honestly, it's really hard to get a great UFO sighting on video. It's hard to take a pic, uh, do a good video of a plane at night. (laughs) But there is a video of the glowing object hovering. Yeah, that was a pretty interesting case. And then I wanted to ask you about one more, but I don't know if it was recent because the dates are confusing to me. But I'm I'm wondering about this portal that opened up in San Antonio. But in the report, it says it happened in 2005. Is that true? Or was there a a more recent experience of it? Yeah, so this sighting did occur in 2005, but it was reported. And let's see, I reported on the 20th. So yes, I think it got reported January 16th, 2016. Does that make sense? It was really interesting because somebody, a parent and their child, not sure if son or daughter, mother, you know, father, witnessed an upside down tornado. So I, that is just, you know, just amazing in it of itself. But then also they said they saw, you know, like papers, like swirling and coming out of the tornado that were silver, copper, gold, and metallic colors. So that's really goofy. Yeah. And they even yeah. said it looked kind of like a portal. And now tornadoes do happen in Texas. They're not really as common in San Antonio. Um, and I used to live there. So that's the thing. They didn't, now we don't know the witness didn't necessarily say anything was odd about the weather either at the time. I mean, they clearly did not think this was a tornado. I was able to find one photo of what looks like an upside down tornado posted on a Pinterest thread and taken by a storm chaser, Jim Reed, apparently. But that was the only thing I could find. Some other people listening might be meteorology, meteorology junkies or know more about this, but I could not find anything about an upside down tornado phenomenon 
and I love to post these things because I always hope, and, and often this happens, that somebody else reading, you know, has seen something like that before or was also there that day <laughs> and can help. Uh, maybe they have photos or videos or something. Well, so that was a real strange one. Yeah, the the interesting thing about this case, though, to me was that, you know, you mentioned that the papers that were coming out of the tornado were gold, silver, and metallic colored. Yeah. But that they also had symbols on them. Yes, right. Yes, good eye. Yes, that was also a really interesting part of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it the symbols aren't well. aren't really <laughs> described by the witness, but that's just mm-hmm. a that's a really you know goes back to our yeah. conversation about Roswell and exactly. Rendlesham and those hieroglyphics. Is that yes? <laughs> I wish they would have tried to grab some of those papers and you know see what kind of symbols were, were printed on them. I know. But, or, or like had taken a photo. Oh, she says, or he says, I really have no idea. When these sometimes these reports, or a lot of time, they go into MUFON, and and I love. The MUFON has a great database, but I have no way of finding out who that witness was. So what I would right. give to follow up with this person, but they did say they regret not having their camera with them. So, yeah, in this case, well, yes, why, it was. Why was this reported to MUFON? This isn't really, this is not your your average, you know, UFO so- yeah, a lot of things get reported there. I think just because there's nothing else to report. And to be fair, I actually get used to get more direct reports from Texas. And I will say people, I think, are increasingly reporting to MUFON, which is honestly, as long as the report gets out there, I don't care. <laughs> right. um, you know, just report your sighting. I, you know, Anybody's welcome to, you know, report their events to me and, you know, I'll do my best to investigate and actually plan to up that frequency soon just kind of getting some things in order. <laughs> so I'm definitely dedicated, but there is MUFON and there are other places to report sightings. And MUFON has been given some new life online. And But I, at the same time, and I won't, I'm not going to make, you know, any necessary conclusions because of this, but the best things that get reported to MUFON, for some reason, MUFON doesn't really highlight them. So they kind of end up, I'm not saying this is on purpose, and this, I can even be a fault of this. You know, I have not reported on everything I've intended to, and I plan a lot is to come. <laughs> so, you know, I understand how it goes. You can't, you can't cover everything. You just can't. It's that huge. It's that frequent. You just can't cover it all. But the best stuff tends to, to not be featured on the MUF on YouTube or on their site. So it just gets buried. You know, because it's one of the top places for people to go report their sighting, but then, you know, MUFON doesn't always share it all. (laughs) So it's kind of unfortunate. So I am always in there and trying to bring out the better things that get reported there, because otherwise it'll just disappear. Hey, I have one last question for you. Sure. And it has to do with chemtrails. I'm sure the activity down there, as far as chemtrails is concerned, is pretty obvious, but... Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Have you had any reports of UFOs around chemtrails in Texas? You know, I have. I'm trying to think if there's been, I feel like I haven't been getting many chemtrail reports lately for some reason. I don't think it's because it's not happening. I, I don't know. It could be. I wonder if there's a seasonality, you know, to it that you could find if you were to study this really in d- deeply. But yeah, I mean, it looks like in, well, in long view in july 2016 it was kind of it could have it's like more not so much ufo at a chemtrail but it's like a wispy long white trail yeah of something that seems to be moving intelligently yeah i'm having trouble finding some recent ones but i definitely that happens there are ufos that show up around these chemtrails quite frequently you know, and it makes you wonder, well, where are the chemtrails coming from? <laughs> you know, is that object that is right by that, well, you know, skeptics would say contrail, having something to do with it, with what's going on. It definitely makes you wonder. Yeah, and you know what? I'm sorry, but the skeptics of chemtrails are pretty fucking stupid to me. Do you know why? Because Point. I know the difference between condensation <sighs> and chemicals. And condensation mm-hmm. trails are the water vapor that evaporates as soon as it hits the atmosphere. I'm sorry, but that's just two different things. Yeah, and I think maybe early on, you know, when there wasn't as much data out there, documentation, it was okay to be skeptical. But I think at this point, we even have lots of things that have been said officially, you know, by companies and scientists talking about geoengineering and talking about how real that science is. So we, it's not even... The potential for it is not theoretical anymore. So just like anything, we know the government's always ahead. 
ahead of things. There was a case in December 2016 in Monterey, California, where there's this huge vapor trail that's just like wandering around. So if it is a con trail, I guess it could have been a crazy jet just doing the most crazy. Uh, maybe it could have been an air show. But somebody had witnessed a round ball actually alongside it. You know, maybe like a drone or something. And then a day later, it could be just me making weird dot connections. <laughs> but a day later, a strange cone-shaped object fell from the sky and damaged a man's fan in Wisconsin. And it was just, you know, similar to, I guess, the object sighted in California. And it could be completely unrelated, but even if it's not, uh, we just see this common theme of these, you know, maybe drone-like objects, really. And then these other weird events happening alongside them. Um, We've seen with rocket launches on more than one occasion now of a rocket, of a failed rocket launch being associated with a UFO sighting or like a drone-like object. So it's like (laughs) there's these small UFOs that show up at the strangest times and we're not supposed to link it to anything. It's not supposed to be a factor with anything. Right. So I'm out of questions for you, Jane. (laughs) I'm very grateful for your time and thank you so much for being here. Uh, Could you tell people where they could keep up with your work? Yeah, so texasufos.com is, you know, I update that every day. Everything ultimately ends up there. I mean, you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat now, all that stuff. But, um, you know, it's all ultimately there. Texas UFO sightings on YouTube, you know, if you're if that's how you like to do stuff. So, yeah, this is so much fun. All right, so take care, and I'll talk to you soon, all right? You as well. All right, there you have it. My thanks again to Jane Kyle. You can find her online at TexasUFOSightings.com. That's linked in the show notes. I've also got links in there to some of the stuff we mentioned, including that article I dug up on an Angel Fire website about the hieroglyph quantum physics connection. There's a link to the Pepsi short film about the Black Knight satellite, which, after watching it again, does have the Pepsi logo at the end of it, so maybe my comment to Jane about it not being funded by them was, in fact, incorrect. There's also links to a couple articles about the Black Knight Satellite's connection to Philip K. Dick's 1974 experience that inspired not just Valus, but several other books of his as well. You know, I mentioned a UFO sighting I had last summer, and until now, I had only mentioned that to one other person. So I'd like to elaborate on that for just a moment, because the same exact thing happened again to me about a week or two ago. Now, the first time, late last summer, I was driving home from work and I was diverted off my normal route due to a car accident. I was driving on a back country road, gorgeous day, driving through a bunch of farmland, and I glance out the driver's side window and hovering in the sky is a dark, metallic, rectangular object. Vertical, not horizontal. And I have to stress, this was just a glance, half a second or less. I saw it, turned back to face the road immediately, and then it registered in my mind, and I did that double take. I turned back again real quick, but it was gone. Just like that. Now the second time, very similar, just a week or two ago, driving someplace on a beautiful Saturday afternoon, similar landscape, glance out the window, spot a similar object, vertical, hovering, dark, metallic, rectangular, but this time I didn't look away, but it just dissolved. Right in front of my eyes in a matter of, again, maybe half a second or a second, just disappeared. And like I told Jane, I didn't find these experiences to be special. They didn't make me feel any certain way. They were just kind of ho-hum, run-of-the-mill, everyday occurrences. Not life-changing at all. Made the afternoon a bit more memorable, I guess. But nothing that made me question my reality or rethink my paradigm. I think I might be over the UFO thing, honestly. I'm definitely over the alien thing. I don't think there's much to that anymore. We didn't touch on that much here. And I guess I'm still open to the idea of intelligent extraterrestrial life, but... I'm still heeding that warning from Warner Von Braun, you know, put that into your search engine if you're curious, or if you're on the fence about aliens in general. And my apologies to any chemtrail skeptics out there, I don't really think you're stupid, but the evidence is overwhelming at this point. I mean, it's right there. Just look up or do some research into geoengineering and then look up and tell me that that's just water vapor or ice crystals, whatever other spin they're trying to put on it these days. And watch the patterning, too. It's very deliberate in terms of location and time of day. 
and there even appears to be heavier doses during specific solar, lunar, and celestial events as well. And go back and listen to episode 3. I, I talk about this with the guys from Grimerica for a couple of minutes. I drive toward the sunrise in the morning and toward the sunset in the evening, and these planes are always spraying in front of the sun as it's rising and setting. And these trails spread out like blankets across the sky. They block out the sun, and on sun nights they block out the moon. If that's water vapor or ice crystals, why are they sticking around so long? Wouldn't they be evaporating or melting? And how are ice crystals floating in the air? A very odd times we're living in when people can flat out deny something that's so obvious and right in front of them. To me, the only thing not obvious about this is why they're doing it. But then again, that may be becoming increasingly obvious as well. Climate change is now a political issue, and it was created by taking control of the environment. It's the Hegelian dialectic weather edition. Create a problem, climate change, incite a reaction, we need to battle climate change, and then offer the solution. We need more of your money to save the environment. Folks, that's how the deep state corporatocracy works to gain your approval and your tax dollars. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the chat. If you did, leave the show a good rating on iTunes or hit that subscribe button on whatever channel you found us on. I actually just saw the show's first rating on iTunes, but it was posted back in January, so I must have missed that. But my thanks to Rich for leaving a five-star review. Much appreciated, man. But that's it for this one. Until next time, this is O'Culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.